Fantastic. All right, so uh, my name is Jeff Heflin. I'm going to be presenting some work done with my colleagues, Brian Davison, who perhaps many of you know because he's more uh, active in this community than I am, and uh, Haiyan Jha from our uh, uh, data, our, sorry, our journalism and mass communication department here at Lehigh University. What I want to talk to you about is an idea of um, search specifically towards data sets and using um, a novel idea called cell-centric indexing as a way to explore and search for such data sets. Before I get into the details here, I would like to um, give you a little bit of context about the project that this is one piece of. Um, so we've been working for almost four years now on uh, approaches to domain agnostic data set search. So we want to make it possible for people to find data sets without having to be experts in the domain the data sets were created in. Um, and so some of the kind of targets would be a data journalist who obviously is not an expert in any one of the fields they're writing stories about, but still nevertheless needs to locate information, or a scientist who is looking for data from another discipline um, that might be relevant to his or her work. There are three main thrusts to this project. Um, the first is understanding how data journalists and scientists find and use data sets. Uh, and that's primarily being led by my colleague, uh, Haiyan Jha. Um, then there's a machine learning for data set search and data cleaning augmentation. Uh, both uh, Brian and myself um, are um, uh, working in that area. And then the third thrust is novel interfaces to support the exploration of data set collections. Um, and that's the work that I'll be specifically uh, talking about today. So let me give you a little bit of a motivation here. So often metadata is insufficient to determine if a table is relevant to a user need. Um, so for example, if somebody is looking for Palo Alto housing prices, there might not be an actual table called Palo Alto housing prices. In fact, it might be in a California table and Palo Alto is just one row or some subset of rows in that table. And, you know, unless the metadata lists all the cities in California that it might have information on, you're probably not going to find it if you only index the metadata. Uh, so we believe that it's really important that for data set search that we index not just metadata, but also find some way to index the content. But what's the right approach for indexing the content? So let me um, first point out a couple of challenges when thinking about indexing the content. So imagine if we had a table that had um, cities in it like Austin, Texas and Paris, France. But if somebody had a query like I'm looking for Paris, Texas, this table's probably not relevant because Paris and, uh, and, and Texas are in different rows, they're in different contexts. So we need to consider the context of the information when doing this. Another issue is the structural variation in tables. Um, so if we had a query where we're trying to find California housing prices, we might have a table called housing prices that has a column state and one uh, and some of the rows in that table might have California as the state. We might have a table that's actually all about California real estate. So in that case, the metadata would be fine. But it's also possible, for example, that we might have a median uh, real estate table that has it by um, year and then a separate column for each state in the United States. So 50 columns with California as one of the columns and just there's a value there for what the, uh, the median price was in that year. A third issue is the query refinement issue, right? So if the user issues a query and gets back way too many results, what's the best way to guide the user in getting a query that gets to a number of results that is reasonable for whatever intent the user has? Uh, we don't want this to be simple trial and error. Well, I'll try this term, oh, it goes down to zero results. I'll try this term, oh, it didn't really make much of a difference. We want to be able to give them a sense of what kinds of terms might make a difference in their query? So 
our proposal is cell-centric indexing. I'm going to kind of first kind of give you a high level thing, get a little bit more into detail a bit later. So consider a table like most Olympic gold medals, which has athlete, nation, sport, um, and then gold, I mean, the number of gold medals that that athlete has uh, secured. So let's imagine that we have, we're focusing on the Michael Phelps cell and the athletic cell, and I'm just going to call them cells 101 and 133. Um, so if we are indexing the cell, so we're thinking of the cell as the fundamental unit of X indexing, not the table, but the cell itself. So we can index the content. That's pretty straightforward, right? That um, uh, athletics um, will be the content of cell 133. Michael and Phelps will be tokens in the posting list for content uh, for 101. We would also have additional fields though to provide contextual information. So the column heading. Uh, so cell 101 has athlete as a token in its column heading. Cell 133 has sport as a, um, as the token um, and so on. One additional thing we add is this notion of row context. So we also index for each cell, what other values appear in the same row with that? So we can see that for 133, the cell that has athletics, that we have context with Carl and Lewis. And for Michael Phillips, the context includes swimming. So when you have a, a query like, content Phelps in the context of swimming, cell 101 will be a relevant cell. So I'm going to come back to some of the implications of this in a little bit, but one of the things that we're trying to do here in this talk is I want to kind of give you a sense of what we can do with this, this approach. So I'm going to talk about the general system design. So, um, basically, what we've indexed, uh, we've implemented is middleware that sits between an Elasticsearch server and the user or the data sets, if you will. So our cell-centric server has two main components. It has an indexer and it has a query processor. The indexer's job is to ingest data sets, translate those into cell-centric fields, and then use an Elasticsearch API to store the data. The query processor will take in queries, and then translate those queries into a series of Elasticsearch API calls. And then from that build histograms that are then returned to our web interface. And the web interface will support, uh, will support visualization and exploration of the data sets. Um, and it issues queries to the self-centric server, which passes them onto Elasticsearch. The query processor pulls, uh, collects those and gives it back to the web interface, which can then take that information and display it. So let me kind of show you a little bit about how we actually store this in a traditional um, information retrieval system like Elasticsearch. So we have a number of different fields that we use. Uh, so we have a column name field. We have a content field. But we also separate a content numeric field so that any token, which is um, clearly a number, uh, will be uh, indexed in the content numeric field. Um, we have a row context field. I've given an example of that. We have a field for the title, which is a tokenized version of the title, but we also have a full title field, uh, which allows us to be able to reconstruct the original title, um, which is useful at times in the interface. Um, and then there's different ways that we have to deal with this. So um, I, in Elasticsearch, there's a number of different types. Most of our fields use the text type, which is tokenized and analyzed. We use the keyword field for, for full title, which means it's indexed just as is. There's no tokenization doing there. And of course, the numeric is a 64-bit floating point numbers. Uh, we use two types of analyzers. So stop is used for most, which divides the text and removes 33 stop words. Uh, for the column name, we have a special analyzer that divides the text at their case transition. So, if the column names happens to use sort of a Java-like convention of running words together in alternating case, that analyzer will tokenize those appropriately um, birth date into birth and date, as you um, see in the example here. So um, 
let me talk a little bit about how we actually go about indexing these things. So we're going to, uh, we read data set metadata from the source data. So we assume that we have access to both the metadata and the content. And then we read the column headings of the data set, H1 through Hn. And then for each row, we read the row values V1 through Vn. We create the row context by concatenating the values. Uh, for each value, we um, index using H sub I, if it's V sub I, with a, the column name field. Um, the tokens of V sub I are indexed into content or content numeric based upon their type. And the other fields is appropriate. There's not a whole lot of complexity here uh, in, uh, you know, in how that works. There's a lot of sort of implementation details, but not too much interesting at the, at the scientific level. Uh, for the query side of things, um, it's actually pretty straightforward for most of it because Elasticsearch supports something called term aggregations, which basically can build a histogram um, on any field that you have. So we can do a query, we can get a histogram and say, give us the top 20 terms and what their frequency is, um, just using Elasticsearch built-in features. We have some special built-in processing to handle numeric content. Because what we want to do with numbers is we want to be able to divide them into buckets, right? We don't want to have to have each numeric token be treated separately in our interface because, say, you know, 10 and 10.0 and 10.0001 are probably for most users all basically the same thing. So we want to make sure that we can group things appropriately. So the idea here is we select a representative set of the content to remove outliers. We then find the mean and standard deviation of the data, excluding those outliers, and then divide the data into five buckets. Um, the actual determination of how those five buckets go depends a bit on the distribution of the data, but if it's roughly uniformly distributed, one bucket will be centered on the mean with two buckets below, um, uh, two buckets above, um, and the three buckets that are not on the ends are basically a standard deviation in width. We then, using those buckets, use Elasticsearch histogram aggregation feature to figure out the frequency of how many cells have values in that. And note, by the way, when I'm talking about numbers here, it doesn't matter what column the numbers are in. It's any number that happens to match the current query, regardless of how many columns that is. We take those numeric content and we insert them into our content histogram, which was based on the terms, so that we have a descending list of frequencies, whether it be a textual term or a numeric bucket. And then that is returned to the interface. So I think this would be a good place for me to give you a, um, an overview of the actual um, interface itself. Um, it's a web-based interface, it's a prototype, so it's not particularly pretty, but we're experimenting with things to get a sense of, well, does this actually help users to find things? When you come into the system, you get a, um, two histograms, a title histogram and a column name histogram that shows the various information. And I'm showing you this slide. I know you're probably not gonna be able to read any of the values on the histogram. Future slides will, um, will zoom in, um, uh, in as we go. So let's look at the, um, this initial screen histogram. So we're first seeing titles and columns to get a sense of what is the content that we have indexed. In this case, looking at essentially half the wiki tables data set. Um, and a lot of that data tends to be sports. You'll see things like championships and football um, uh, and um, statistics and teams and things like that. Um, but there is other data there, including um, film, uh, which is down here. And so if the user says, OK, I'm interested in film, they can click on that bar to generate a new set of histograms that focus on what does the data set have regarding film. And then we bring in some additional histograms to let them look at it. So we keep the title and the columns, but now it's only title and columns 
for any cells that happen to have film in their title. And so we can see that the film, uh, the title of the, and so by the way, it's the title is the title of the data set here, not the title of the film. So the title of the data set, we can see films, we might see American films or Italian films or Bollywood films. Now the column names are very film specific. We have director, the title there is actually the title of the film, the cast and so on. We have a content histogram. Uh, and if you look at this content histogram, you'll see one of the numeric buckets here. So we have a 1918 to 2740 bucket that has a lot of values. That probably has a lot of years in it. Now, what exactly the 2741 is, I have no clue, uh, but you could use the data set to explore that if you were interested. Now, let's say the user was interested in Italian films. Um, so they could click on the Italian bar there and that will create another query that will now re, uh, 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 filter down to Italian things. Now, obviously the column names aren't gonna change that much for Italian films, right? We still have director and cast and things like that, but maybe there are some differences you see here. Um, we have a content histogram, we have a row um, context histogram and, and so on. So let's say I'm interested in directors. So I can click on the director bar. And now I'm gonna be able to sort of say, okay, I'm looking for information about directors of Italian films. And this is where the content histogram is gonna change because now we're specifically focusing on content of a given column, columns that deal with directors. So in this situation here, if you focus down on the content histogram, we'll see like Mario, we'll see Luigi, Sergio, Etc. So we'll see the names of various directors, and these are names of, Ita of Italian film directors. Now, if I wanted to look at the row context, um, there's a more items thing. So I can always, it shows by default the first 10, but if I wanted to find more, I would click on that more button and then I can get down to comedy in this row context. So let's say I'm interested now in directors of Italian comedies. Again, it, um, it, the, the interface processes this and we are down to a number of directors. Um, and let's say I just happened to click on say Sergio. Then I get all of the directors named Sergio of Italian comedy films. Uh, and we get essentially three director names. Uh, Sergio Cobucci, Sergio Rubini, and Sergio City. I'm sorry, I don't know Italian comedies, but I thought it would be an appropriate example given where um, you know, half of the conference is right now. Um, and so that's the kind of the idea that you can explore the data set and focus in, and it doesn't have to have the information you're looking for in the metadata to be able to find it. And you can make contextually specific queries. Um, one thing I haven't shown you is at the bottom, if you scroll down below those four histograms, we also have a full title histogram. We'll show you exactly which data sets has this information and how much information each data set has. So the list of Italian films of 1987 has two entries and then 75 has two entries and so on and so forth. So you find the actual data sets and if we were to click on any one of these bars, we would get the option to actually do a web search for that data set um, and to be able to go, say, download the data set or explore it as you might like. Um, in this case, being that this data is from wiki tables, obviously it should be available on the web. Um, I'm just gonna go real quickly through this as I know I'm getting close to the end of my time. And part of what we wanna do here is have lots of time for discussion and questions. Um, so the formalization of cell-centric indexing, um, right? So at the basic level, we can imagine there being four important fields, the content, the title, the column name, the row context, and some table, which is a tuple consisting of its label L, its headings, uh, which is a list H1 through HN, and its values V, which is essentially a matrix um, where V I sub J is the value in the I row and the J column then basically the index is just picking out what goes in what fields, right? The content is the cells, um, uh, the VI sub J, the title is L, the column name is H sub J that corresponds to the column the, uh, the cells in and the row context 
is the union of all cells um, in the same row, in this case, row I. Um, to handle the, uh, the, the display and the, the search for things, so cell-centric indexing itself doesn't allow you to be able to find terms, we use a notion of conditional frequency vectors. Um, we've abstracted that. It's basically just a way to create histograms over data. In our abstraction, we assume that you have a set of items I and a set of descriptors D, and we can um, say, okay, find out what the frequency is of a descriptor given a query. So a query applies to the feature, gets a subset of that, and then we can create a histogram over the various descriptors there. And I won't go into the math here for that right now. Um, so the current status is we've implemented the cell-centric server. Uh, we've loaded three different data collections. We have a wiki tables data collection. We have a subset of data.gov, which is um, basically open data from the US government uh, and uh, a set of data that was provided by our partner uh, data.world. Um, and then we have a prototype web interface. Um, I'm gonna skip the related work um, just so that we can finish up and get to question time. So um, some of the future research questions we have here with this is, well, does the interface actually make it easier for users to find data sets from outside their domain of expertise? So um, we are uh, planning to conduct a number of user studies uh, to investigate that question. We're also interested in, are histograms the most effective way to provide summaries? Um, are there better ways of doing this? For example, you can imagine that for some fields, a map um, or a timeline might be more appropriate way of looking at data, but will that uh, uh, mesh well with other kinds of data being in histograms, right? So what's the right way to do that? Um, of course, there's issues on system implementation. So our index actually ends up being very large given the way we do it. And there's a lot of redundancy because every cell in a table has index information about that table's title and other metadata about it. Um, so there might be different approaches to, uh, to indexing um, that would be advantageous here. And finally, we're thinking about on the other side of our project where we're using machine learning to do various kinds of analysis and augmentation of data sets. To what extent can features that are learned be integrated in with this and will they help the user in finding what they're doing? So for example, one feature you might want to learn is can you learn a semantic type for a column? Like, can you learn that this represents a person or a place um, regardless of what the actual data type of the cell is. All right, so that's basically uh, the end of my presentation. I um, uh, just wanted to acknowledge the National Science Foundation um, who has supported much of this work. And there was a large number of students who have been involved in this project over the years. Alex Johnson, Xu Wei Wang, DePaul Miller, Lishwan Chu, Drake Johnson, and Keith Register um, have all, you know, without the, them, none of this would be possible. So thank you everyone. And I'm happy to uh, take any questions that you might have and participate in the discussion. Thank you very much, Jeff. Uh, so should I be? Um... We'll, we'll direct you. So we'll, I'll get some questions uh, live. We have already one and then I'll monitor the, the chat. So. Unfortunately, I can barely hear whoever is speaking. Okay, no, uh, it was wished off. Sorry. Uh, so, <laughs> thank you very much for the talk, the sword. Uh, I have a curiosity about the term aggregation used in Erasmus session, specifically for the raw content. Uh, did you use the just the term aggregation, which uses the foreground set? frequencies or occurrences, or the significant terms aggregation that takes into account the foreground set and the background set in frequencies or, I don't know, something different when extracting the histogram for like the raw content or potentially also the other instrument. 
So I'm not exactly sure um, what you mean by foreground set and background set in this context. So the, yeah, the, uh, so the foreground set effect is the result set returned by Elasticsearch. So I guess in this case is the cells. I mean, each mm -hmm. single document is a cell. And the background set is the entire corpus of oh. cells. Yeah, we're only using the foreground set for anything that we build. So it's the query is everything is based upon the current um, standing query. And as I was showing you sort of the screenshots from the interface, at any time it looks at, okay, given the context you have now, you've got this query, now we're gonna build a new set of term aggregations that are responsive to that query. And that's why we're able to kind of narrow in on more specific terms, right? So we got Italian names when we picked Italian um, films and then director. Okay, that so probably could be a good idea to take a look to the significant terms aggregation because the terms are just ranked differently. So you get the terms from the foreground set, but the way they are ranked, so potentially to easy the navigation is based also on the background set. It is made to try to highlight what's significant among the foreground set in comparison to what's normally uh, frequent in the background. Oh, I see. So being able to look at sort of what stands out now yes. compared to the, the distributions. Yes, um, that's a great point. Um, and a completely different system I had developed um, for a completely different kind of problem. We did something like that, but that's a great point. Yes, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. David, all yours. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. So uh, I, I work at a, a company where we have like an old database and, you know, there's a lot of like very technical columns that are working with that. Um, I guess my question to you is, say you were working with a data set that you wanted to put in this that had some columns that were very technical where you needed domain knowledge to be able to understand what it's asking or talking about. How do you recommend working with that in this system? So what this system would do is it would tokenize whatever information you have. So your column names would be tokenized. Now, if, if, if they're acronyms, right, then obviously it can't tokenize um, those acronyms beyond that. But you would essentially just have those names um, as possible things. This would be probably a situation where I mentioned how augmenting data could possibly help. So perhaps you'd want to have some additional approach which could expand those column names with metadata about them, with descriptions of the columns or something like that. If you were really trying to help somebody who wasn't familiar with the column names already to be able to still explore the data set, I would say that would be the right approach. And then we could, you know, it's easy to add new histograms into this because everything just kind of goes into Elasticsearch. Elasticsearch gives us back a structure that we can then process and then on our front end turn into a histogram that displays. So as long as we get frequencies and terms, um, we can turn that into a histogram. So um, yeah, I would say you might create an initial histogram with say um, descriptive information about the columns or something like that. Would that perhaps help, um, David? I think so, thank you. Any more questions from the audience? One last question, Jeff. You mentioned uh, Wiki, Wikidata and Wikipedia in general, and sometimes all these tables are chopped among different pages. So how, how do I know that I'm indexing one table or I'm indexing you know, pagination of the same table? That seems to be like a hard problem. That's actually, that's a good point. So we actually didn't do this raw from Wikidata or Wikitables uh, or Wikidata it's ourselves. We didn't crawl it. We took a existing crawl of Wikitables um, and loaded that in. So that question was answered by the crawl itself, right? So whatever they ended up doing is how we've ended up breaking it up. Um, but yes, I think if you were doing your own crawl, you'd want to be very careful about that kind of thing to make sure that if tables are paginated, you probably do want to collect them together, or maybe you want 
to just add to the title, right? This is page one of this table or page two of this table. Um, that's an interesting question. One last uh, question. We have uh, Brian Johnson from Apple who just joined us. Uh, Brian, go for it while we set up the next talk. Hey, Jeff, that was a great talk. I really liked it. <laughs> You're maybe familiar with some of this work, but uh, uh, in HCI Lab at Maryland, they did a lot of dynamic query work uh, long ago, information visualization. I put a couple of rele relevant links in the chat. Um, but one of the examples was this home finder where you could say, you know, I want one, two, three, four bedrooms or one or two car garages. And then you could move back and forth and you could see different neighborhoods in the Washington DC area. It's just a great use. It's a great use case. You don't see a lot of these in consumer interfaces because they're a little bit complicated, but um, like you're saying, when you start doing these histograms like this, you can see when you're going to get no results before you get there. So I, I'm, I'm great. I'm really happy to see it continuing. <laughs> yeah, it's funny you mentioned Maryland. I took a user interface course from Ben Schneiderman when I was at Maryland many, many years ago. So yeah. <laughs> some of that inspiration still comes through Maryland user interfaces. Ben was my PhD advisor. <laughs> Okay.